Hello and welcome back to Patrick Replies, the second channel show where I, Patrick, respond to your questions and comments about the latest video. Uh, this one is a little bit late because we've been busy with other stuff, but anyway, today we're talking about Who is Killing Cinema? A Murder Mystery. Uh, a video that has been in the works for a long time. Originally the plan was to make it as part of the content episode, and then uh, there was so much material that we had to expand them into two separate videos, and this one turned into like a feature-length film. Um, but it's it's done well. People seem to like it. And also, it seems like people had a, a lot of comments on it. There's like 5,000-something comments on this video, so this might be a long replies episode. As always, we're going to begin with uh, comments pulled by our community manager, Emma Logsdon, from the YouTube comments section. And first, uh, Emma made a special folder just for this. So in this video, we present six different suspects for who might be killing cinema. And not all of them are super serious. But since we had to narrow it down to six, Obviously, there are a lot of potential suspects that got left out, and so we got a whole lot of comments saying some variation of, why didn't you include this? That's why I made a whole separate companion video over on Nebula, where I go through several of the, the suspects that didn't quite make the cut, such as the pandemic, and capitalism, and television and audiences, stuff like that. So if you want to know why those didn't make the cut, go on over to Nebula and check that out. And so of course, in the comments, we have people asking why I didn't consider COVID. A lot of people saying it's capitalism, it's capitalism. A lot of people saying don't bother watching a 90 minute video, it's capitalism, that's the answer to everything. The pandemic, the pandemic, uh, audiences, audiences are bad and dumb, stuff like that. And I address all of them in much more detail over in the Nebula bonus video. Uh, the short version is I think the pandemic accelerated things that were already happening. So if anything, it's an accomplice, uh, not actually the culprit. Let's see what else. Capitalism. I mean, I even bring it up in the video. Like, yes, capitalism is kind of at the root of a lot of this. Uh, but also, I think it's too easy to just say capitalism's to blame and like walk away as if that really solves anything. And also, American cinema has always existed like, within capitalism that's always been a part of it. Uh, and so I don't think it's as simple as just being like, you know, that's it, that's 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 the big boogeyman, um, and then moving on. And as for audiences, um, I don't know, audiences uh, have always liked bad, shitty stuff, and audiences have always been obnoxious. So yeah, I don't think they're to blame. But, uh, but anyway, go watch the other video. Sign up for Nebula. It's a great place. Ooh, here's one from Crumblebee saying, I was going to watch a movie when I got home from work, and now I'm watching this feature-length YouTube video. Are you killing cinema? That is something that I had not considered. I really hope I'm not. I would like to believe that I encourage people to watch movies more often than I distract them from watching movies. I don't know. Uh, I mean, that's really more a comment about, like, is YouTube and, like, are people choosing to watch YouTube instead of watching movies? I don't know. I feel like I might be in the minority here where, like, even as good as the best stuff on YouTube is, I'll probably always choose to watch a movie first. In terms of, like, my peers who are, are in my industry, whatever that means. But other people I know who, you know, make videos for a living, um, I think I watch less YouTube than any of them. I don't know, I just like movies a lot. And, uh, and so I'm just always gonna choose movies. I really hope that I'm not the one killing cinema. That would, that would suck. That would be, be ironic, but it would, I'd be bummed out. Okay, so now let's get to the rest of the comments. Dion McVeigh says, I would argue that Roger Rabbit popularized the concept of multiverses in mainstream media before Marvel did, thanks to all the IP crossovers, making him still a suspect. Damn, that is uh, a good point. I will say, multiple people have brought this up. We might see this again in the comments. So having Roger Rabbit as a suspect um, did begin as just fully a joke. Uh, that was the brainchild of Mike Curran, one of our writers, uh, and he wrote the whole Roger Rabbit thing. And then I think it, it was maybe like one, around when I released the video that I did start thinking like, you know, what Roger Rabbit was kind of like 
the first modern IP mashup movie. Like, there's a straight line from Who Framed Roger Rabbit to the Lego movie, and then, you know, the way worse version, uh, like Space Jam A New Legacy. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, maybe Roger Rabbit did have a worse impact than we thought. Also, one thing that did not occur to me until after I released the video uh, is that it, we bring up that we say that that Roger Rabbit was a suspect in the Zodiac killings, and uh, I I think we all just kind of forgot about the fact that Charles Fleischer, who voices Roger Rabbit, plays the creepy guy in the basement in Zodiac, the David Fincher movie. So there you go. I want my slaw, says, because most people have wised up and realized that watching movies is pretty pointless. Uh, note from Emma, nice Magnolia reference. Emma's really into Magnolia right now. Um, I'm gonna guess that I want my slaw did not intend that as a reference to the Amy Mann song. But um, anyway, uh, this guy sounds like a huge bummer. Um, I'm gonna guess he also doesn't watch this channel regularly, so he probably isn't watching this. Watching movies is pretty pointless. You know, most leisure activities, you could argue, are pretty pointless. So yeah, sure, watching movies is pointless. But you know what is way more pointless? Commenting on YouTube videos. Moving on. SMVMJ Sun, I don't know. Don't even need to watch the video. Woke is killing everything, including cinema. Oh, one of those comments. Uh, movies are no longer entertainment, they are vehicles for the one-sided message, and people are tired of it. So last weekend, uh, as uh, a fun activity, actually this wasn't fun, but it, it occurred to me that, oh yeah, like, there's probably, if there's like 5,000 something comments, there's probably a bunch that are people complaining about, you know, like, wokeness as the real culprit for what's killing cinema. So I, I spent a little while... And I went through the comments. Uh, I just did like a search in the YouTube dashboard for the word woke. And I deleted every comment that had that word. And I blocked every person who posted a comment with that word from ever commenting again. And then I made woke a flagged word. So any comment that anyone posts uh, that says it is immediately like, separated out and deleted. So look, there were a lot of people posting comments saying that wokeness is responsible for killing cinema, and I'm not gonna say all of these people are morons, but I will say that they are misguided and incorrect, uh, and I hope that maybe they wise up and uh, and and maybe like change their perspective and rethink things and um, and realize that uh no, no, uh, a black little mermaid is not actually a bad thing in cinema at all. And if you think that is the problem, maybe just re-examine things uh, because that not no, that's that's not it. Also, I'm, I'm, I'm just so I'm just so sick of the word woke now. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Okay, uh, let's move on from this bad comment. Ooh, to a long one. Curtis Turpin says, question for the Patrick Replies video. Here we are. How would you address the fall of the movie star versus the rise of the director star? Like, for me, as a teenager, I'd go see movies that starred movie stars that I liked a lot. Robert Downey Jr., Christian Bale, Will Smith, and don't get me wrong, I still watch movies for the actors I enjoy. However, more of my decision-making when I go see a movie is more weighted to who's behind the camera, the director, the writers, etc. Like, for Oppenheimer, a lot of people went to go see that because Nolan directed it, and I got so excited for Barbie because Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach were behind the camera. Or Ryan Johnson's success... Uh, anyway, thoughts. Uh, oh yes, it was also cinema commentators like you and Movies with Mikey, shout out to Mikey Newman, uh, that even got me to consider that there were actually people behind the camera in the first place, so thanks for broadening my horizons. You're welcome, and thank you for watching. So I think I might have seen some other comments bringing this up as well, about, uh, are, like, directors replacing actors as the, like, the true stars or, like, the draws for the audience? And um, I'm going to say no. Here is what I think the case is, and I, I believe this pretty strongly. To the general audience, the vast majority of the movie-going public, 
Uh, they don't know and don't care who directs the movies. They don't pay attention to that. And this has been the case, I think, for the majority of cinema. You go back to, like, the 1940s, and there's a small handful of directors that the general public knows, like Alfred Hitchcock, and then over time, Stanley Kubrick and Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Martin Scorsese, nowadays, Christopher Nolan, that kind of thing. Uh, those are the ones that, like, everybody is aware of, where the name means something. But outside of those few, your average moviegoer uh, doesn't really care or pay attention to who is directing the movie. Then there is the much smaller group of, this word always sounds so pretentious, but let's say cinephiles, like people who are really into movies and care a lot about movies um, and pay attention to like the credits uh, in the movies. And those people, again, a much smaller group, are the ones who go see movies because of who directed them. And so, Curtis, what you're describing here, I don't think this is like a new occurrence, like in the 21st century. I just think you experienced, I think what you know, what I did uh, years ago and, and what what a lot of other people do, which is just kind of going from, you know, watching movies more casually to getting more, like, seriously and actively into movies and becoming a cinephile. Uh, that That's really it. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think this is happening more now than it used to. Um, but yeah, that is that is my take on the rise of the director star. Moving on. Margot McGeehan says, Your comments near the end about making more comedies reminded me that SNL used to be a pretty reliable system for making movie stars. Uh, cast members like Eddie Murphy, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Mike Myers, and Will Ferrell could be regularly seen as box office draws and still have the potential to do smaller comedies or dramas, work with critically acclaimed directors, or even develop their own material with franchises such as Ghostbusters, Shrek, or Beverly Hills Cop being just drops in the bucket in comparison. New cast members who would have had that career in decades past are either having those big budget attempts bomb at the box office and gravitating towards smaller films that aren't as profitable, like Kristen Wiig or Kate McKinnon, are pivoting towards television and streaming, see Ted Lasso on Apple TV, or I think you should leave on Netflix, even comedy groups adjacent to SNL aren't receiving these chances. Compare The Lonely Island releasing Hot Rod and Popstar uh, in theaters, even if they fizzled at the box office and became cult hits later, to newer group Please Don't Destroy having their upcoming film delayed and premiering on Peacock, and as I'm writing this, still has not received a trailer Bear in, bear in mind this movie is supposed to be releasing in a month. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, for decades, SNL was a huge launching pad for, like, comedy movie stars. And a lot of the movies that they'd, they'd jump into, like, from SNL were movies that, like, you know, were pretty low budget. Like, Animal House or Caddyshack or Meatballs and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, really, I think what you're describing here is that... Uh, you know, the American studio comedy uh, is is in a really bad place. Like, it has almost fully died out. I desperately hope it comes back. I mean, I, I said so in the video. And so, yeah, if if the movies come back, then I imagine that SNL would will still be there, you know, to, like, fill the roles that they need for those movies. So, fingers crossed. Meredith Sutton says, don't listen to Emma Patrick, the mustache is the heart of the episode. I will say, in Emma's defense, we, and by that I mean Mike and Jake, wrote those lines for her, uh, complaining about the mustache. I think in real life Emma is pro-mustache, so, you know, don't give Emma any grief online about negative mustache comments. That was just the script that Emma was handed. Um, I really enjoyed your case for the importance of movie theaters. I'd forgotten how much I enjoyed going to the movies. I had a kid back in 2020, and then 2020 was 2020. So for several years, the only movies I saw in theaters were a handful of Marvel movies. But this summer, I got to do a Barbenheimer double feature for my birthday, and holy cow, it was such a great experience. It's the shared experience from, with my friend and the rest of the theater, the scale of seeing Killian Murphy's face on a gigantic screen, of laughing at clever jokes with a bunch of strangers, or not being able to pause or read IMDb or do anything but watch the movie. Movie. Any advice for someone who wants to go to the movies more, but is self-conscious about going alone? I'm so used to seeing movies as a social event, but I can rarely get the child care to go with my husband. Okay, I can totally empathize with you because I used to feel the same way. Especially, I think this is the case if you like live in a small town or somewhere that's not a major city. Because, granted, I'm a very anxious person who's also just like very self-conscious about everything, but especially 
back when I lived in my hometown, uh, and like in, in high school or college or whatever, my fear was always that if I went to the movies alone, then people from high school would see me there. They'd be in a group and they'd see that, pa that Patrick was there alone. And they'd be like, what a loser. He has no friends to go to the movies with him. And then after I graduated from college and I moved back home, uh, and then especially that fall, uh, 2010, um, I would often go to the movies with Matt, uh, but he was he was uh, in the city doing an internship that fall. And so I was like, ah, oh, shit. I like... I want to see these movies. That was like like the Social Network and Moneyball were coming out, and I was like, I I guess I just gotta suck it up and and go see these movies alone if I want to see them at all. And that was when something occurred to me, which is that it's kind of weird that going to the movies is viewed as a social activity. Like it's such a classic thing to do, like you know, for dates or just like with groups of friends because. Essentially, if you're doing it right, going to the movies means you sit silently in a dark room uh, and don't look at each other. You Everyone, like, watches a screen. So why is this a social thing if all you're doing is sitting silently, not facing each other? Like, if anything, it makes more sense to do alone. And then when I moved to the city, uh, I started going to the movies, like, by myself most of the time. I would say I maybe see movies alone like 70% of the time, and I go to the movies pretty often. And uh, and here in the city, you know, you, you go to the movies and you realize like, oh wait, like most people are here by themselves, especially if it's like, you know, on a weekday. So yeah, there you go. I think it's just a, uh, so, you know, go watch movies alone. It's great. Lurpa5 says Denzel can still bring the butts in. The freaking Equalizer 3 made $150 million somehow. It made $150 million because Denzel is a legitimate movie star. He is arguably our greatest living movie star. Uh, yeah, he can still do it. So many people will still show up for Denzel. Even if, you know, he's just doing like Antoine Fuqua movies now and... Uh, I miss the days of the Denzel Tony Scott movies. But anyway, Denzel, he's the best. Zan917 says, I think I caught two Batman references in the script. Um, quite possibly. I can think of one off the top of my head, uh, but there's probably more. I tend to just like absentmindedly put Batman references into things. Anyway, sound off in the comments. Tell me. Tell me where the Batman references are. Okay, here are two comments uh, about the Halo TV series. Uh, one person, Cloudin3, uh, did watch it, and Liwa Toaufair uh, didn't watch it, uh, despite being a Halo fan, and apparently it was panned by the fan base for its disregard of the source material. That's funny, because looking at the Halo trailer, it looked to me like, uh, I was like, that looks like Halo. Yeah, that's all the stuff I recognized from the the little bit that I played Halo years ago. So yeah. Anyway, the Halo show. Seems like it should have been a bigger deal than it was. B7944 says, The make-believe magic is gone. We all know how it is done now. We can follow actors on social media, watch BTS, etc. Actors do not act realistically. Directors are lazy. Music is lame. They know we know it is just a product. What is this comment? Uh, we know how movies are made, and so... And so, like, they're not good anymore? Actors do not act realistically? <laughs> this person sucks. Anyway, I don't even know what to say to this. This this is insane. That's right, because of social media, we know that actors are just people who are pretending and reciting words that were written in a script. Anyway, I I don't even know what to say to this. Uh, <laughs> what a funny comment. Shafto Dynamite 007 says, Okay, but who is Raven Thigpen? Okay, so uh, it's written, you know, in the opening title sequence. It's right there on screen. Raven is our researcher, who I think, especially in these past couple episodes, did an incredible job. Like, the amount of research she put together w w was I insane. Um, also, she's one of my best friends. Wonderful person. I'm a huge fan. Um, yeah, there you go. Why is who in, in all caps? Weird comment.
Odra Sir Comics says, Audiences are more immature these days and need escapism to deal with harsh economic conditions. Also, the market is saturated with boring, overused cliches. Also, most of the young generation's common sense and logical education level is falling. Chill out. I, 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 another comment I don't know how to respond to. What's up with cliches? Yeah, I don't know. Just, just chill out, dude. Okay, moving on. Klar text. Dude. Could you lay your hands flat on the table for one minute, please? Okay, uh, apparently this person is very upset that I, you know, sometimes gesticulate with my hands and uh, make hand gestures while speaking, which um, I think is a pretty normal thing for humans to do. I'm guessing that Klartext here uh, probably doesn't go outside very much and doesn't uh, talk to other humans in person very much. If you're so disturbed by the idea of, of a person going like this while they speak. Also, as weird as you might find me moving my hands, I feel like it would look way weirder if I sat there for the whole video with my hands like flat on a table, not moving them. So I don't know why you want me to do that? Anyway, a bunch of weirdos in this comment section. Lobachevsky says, question, video games have been around as a commercial alternative for entertainment and even artistic expression for 40 years. When will they be considered traditional media? I think it is important because they are being still treated as a novelty, and I think it hurts the analysis when video games are mentioned, that is. Hmm, I don't know if I have an answer for that. I mean, th there's some aspects of video games that, you know, might disqualify them from being called traditional media. You know, them, them being games, for one thing. Like, do we call, you know, do we call Scrabble our Monopoly traditional media? Do we call Dungeons & Dragons traditional media? I mean, that doesn't even involve, like, electronic stuff. That's just, uh... You know, a lot of, like, papers and, and dice and figurines on a table. Um, I don't know. I, I do not know. I mean, like, yes, video games have just been a part of, like, the media landscape for such a long time. I don't know. Does traditional media just mean media that, like, predates, m like, microchips and computerized elements? I, I don't know. I, look, I, I do not, you know, create the vernacular for, you know, the Western world, so I am not in charge of, of what is called traditional media. Th that's up for other smarter people to decide. Okay, wow, well, long comment. Uh, Matthew Phillips says, Hi Patrick, great video and I appreciate how you left pirating out of your list of suspects. I remember a lot of studios pre-pandemic were blaming low numbers for certain movies on pirating, which has always rung hollow to me as an excuse. And seems like studio executives trying to pass the buck instead of admitting their own mistakes. Not to veer into political territory, but blaming the public seems to be a pretty common corporate tactic when trying to redirect responsibility. It's a, it's a long comment. There's more stuff here about, you know, the, the financials and stuff like that and like tax write-offs and all that. But down at the bottom, my question for you. How do you think pirating fits into this discussion of online media consumption? Does pirating have a place? How do you think studios will interact with pirating moving forward? Okay, the great pirating question. So when it comes to movie piracy, uh, to my knowledge, we don't... It, it, it's not like we have statistics and metrics and numbers uh, to, to accurately gauge, like, this, the scale of piracy uh, and also to what degree it impacts or hurts, like, you know, box office numbers. So what we can go on is mostly anecdotal. And in my opinion, when it comes to movies in particular, I think the effect of piracy is very much overstated. Look, movie piracy and bootlegs and stuff like that, it's existed for decades. And especially like like the current version, like the internet torrenting, that kind of thing, that's been around for like 20-ish years. And despite it being a pretty common accessible thing, I genuinely believe that it's a very small portion of the movie-going public uh, that is actually pirating movies. Okay, look, I'll put it like this. 
When it comes to some of these things, I like to use my parents as a test subject, just to see like what is the reach of certain things. And so when music piracy became a thing, like when Napster was on the scene, I remember my dad coming home from work. I think he'd heard about Napster on like the, you know, on the news on the radio while driving home. And he came into me, I was like on the computer, and he was like, Patrick, I heard about this Napster thing. Do you have Napster? I was like, yes, dad. I have Napster. He's like, I just remembered this song that I really like. Can you get the song? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I, and I go and like download the song for him. It takes a minute. At no point ever did my dad ever ask me to like pirate or download a movie or anything like that. Like, I don't even think my dad knows what a BitTorrent is. Because I think when it came to like, you know, wanting to watch movies without spending a lot of money... The default option for most people has always been, oh, you rent it. And then renting became replaced by streaming. I think most movie piracy is mostly done by younger people who are very online. Uh, and so, yeah, when studios complain that piracy is like, you know, like that's the reason that the box office is down, I don't really think that's the case. In the 21st century, the era of rampant movie piracy, movies still make tons and tons of money in theaters. So yeah, I think it's overstated. I think studios should uh, chill out about it. I don't pirate movies myself. Like I, I used to, to torrent all the TV shows I watched and then, I don't know, by the time I was like 30 and I was like, you know, I'm an adult. I, you know, I have an income, I can afford to subscribe to streaming platforms or whatever. Like, um, I just, I don't know. I put that all behind me. So uh, yeah, anyway, there's my take on piracy. Quantic Prophecy said, this year had great comedies. Bottoms, Joyride, The Blackening, and Theater Camp were all excellent, especially in their own subgenres. Yeah, there were comedies this year. Uh, of those, uh, I really, really liked Bottoms and Theater Camp. Um, I do think it is worth noting that those were all, like, you know, lower budget, smaller releases. You know, none of those were, like, major studio comedies. Comedies still exist, just like, you know, good original dramas for adults, but they're just being watched by a smaller audience. Uh, and that's what we, and that's what we want to change. And wow, that is it for the comments from YouTube. Wow, we got through them and it wasn't too bad. Okay, and so now we are moving over to the questions from our Discord server and the Ask Patrick channel there. In case you're new here, our Discord server is available exclusively to members of the Patreon. Uh, and there you can join us on Discord and you know, chat about movies and stuff like that. And in the Ask Patrick channel, any questions pertaining to the latest video, I will cover in this video. And any random question, um, I will answer just in Discord, in text form. But I will answer everything. Well, I just went out to get a drink uh, before we start the second half of this. Okay, so... Let's see, in Discord, what we have first. Pipe Bomb says, Hey Patrick, do you think studios will get the wrong message from Everything Everywhere All at Once winning Best Picture this year and make the multiverse craze the seventh suspect in the future? Or will it inspire studios to attempt reviving cinema by greenlighting maximalist surrealist gonzo cinema like Speed Racer, 3,000 Years of Longing, and Cronenberg's Existence? Maximalist cinema usually underperformed pre-everything everywhere, but do you think the film's unexpected success will inspire studio executives to give visually exciting movies a second shot after all these recent visually indifferent blockbusters flopping? Okay, I'll answer this part first. Uh, so as we know, Hollywood tends to learn the wrong lessons from things. We have infinite evidence going back decades and decades. As for the multiverse thing, I mean, there might be uh, some more movies, probably like, I would guess like indie-ish or smaller movies uh, that do stuff with it and try to capitalize on the, you know, the everything everywhere hype. But I think the way multiverse stuff has mostly been used in like more mainstream movies, like, you know, like big studio franchise comic book movies, uh, the multiverse is mostly there just kind of as like a ploy to turn regular like franchise sequels into legacy sequels by being like, ooh, 
here's a Spider-Man sequel, but actually it's a sequel to that Spider-Man movie from 20 years ago, and here's the other Spider-Man you love. Uh, and, like, here's Michael Keaton as Batman again. Here's Patrick Stewart as Professor X. Everything is all connected. Uh, you know, go see it because y you like that thing from decades ago. But I'm gonna guess that most studio executives didn't look at everything everywhere and go like, oh, Oh, multiverses. That's the reason it's successful, right? Um, I think it's more likely that they looked at it and went like, oh, people like wacky, weird stuff and fight scenes and Michelle Yeoh and, and that kind of thing. We also do have to remember that Everything Everywhere All at Once was an A24 release uh, that was like very successful for one of their movies, but it didn't make a billion dollars or anything like that. So I'm going to say no to it leading to a bunch more multiverse movies, but I think for smaller studios and distribution companies like A24 or Neon and that kind of thing, this was already along the lines of the kind of thing they would be interested in. But when it comes to the bigger studios... I don't want to get my hopes up and say like, yeah, they'll be greenlighting stuff like Speed Racer all the time now. So yeah, uh, I, I do not foresee a new era of maximalist cinema. Okay, the next part. I remember somebody's quote you used in your Gonzo Blockbuster video that you reached a ceiling in special effects. I think that was Dennis Murin? Has modern cinematic storytelling, especially the MCU, reached its own ceiling as well? Do you think the recent bad blockbuster fatigue will inspire studios to give these original films a second chance, as their 15-year-old formula is finally wearing off? So I don't think modern cinematic storytelling has reached any kind of ceiling. I think cinema always has new places it can go to, and it will always keep evolving. As for the MCU, I think what mostly happened there is just that they made so much of it, and so the novelty kind of wore off over time. And now that, you know, they just released so many movies and now TV shows every single year, eventually people kind of realize, like, oh, these do all kind of look and feel the same. It doesn't feel as special anymore. Oh, we've seen so many, like, crossover cameos and spin-off setups that that, which used to be so exciting... It is is just kind of like old hat at this point. And so, yeah, like if if Marvel, you know, wants to get people excited again, I think they need to, you know, take risks on like interesting filmmakers and actually let them do their thing without, you know, caring so much about, you know, connecting everything in the multiverse saga, which I honestly don't think the general public is all that excited about. Uh, especially because now, like, what are they going to do with with Kang as their their big villain? I think they should really just try to make, like, some standalone good movies that don't rely on, like, nostalgia or, like, you know, connective tissue between other movies to get people excited. But, yeah. But, yeah, I don't know if Hollywood realizes this, but I do think... Uh, they need to start moving away from recycling the same intellectual properties over and over and over again if they want to, like, increase profits and get audiences excited because they've been doing that for a long time. Okay, Harry Webb, the Webb. Uh, hey, Patrick, in terms of cultivating the next generation of movie stars, who are your top five to ten picks of rising stars who you think have true movie star potential, and what kind of roles do you think they should pursue to claim that true movie star status? Oh, God. Um, next generation of movie stars. Are we talking people, like, in their 20s right now? Ah. Oh. I always, like, draw a blank when it comes to this stuff. Um, I will say, this is not even, like, a real answer, but uh, ever since Everybody Wants Some, years ago, I've been like, when's Glenn Powell gonna be a movie star? Look at this guy. He's, he's so charming. Uh, and then, you know, Top Gun Maverick got him, like, a big step further along. He's, like, in a huge hit movie. He's got, like, one of the really fun, like, standout parts. Uh, and now Hitman, this new uh, movie he made with, with Richard Linklater, everyone loves it at all the film festivals. It seems like a, a really great, crowd-pleasing movie, and I'm so mad that Netflix bought it. And of course, we'll like not give it a theatrical release and we'll not promote it, and um, and it sucks because uh, it seems like this is the movie that that should make him a movie star. So I've just been rooting for this guy for a while, but I don't know. There's there's a million people I'm forgetting. I don't know. I'm Whenever I get questions like this, I just totally go blank and like forget 
every actor I've ever seen. Sorry. Jack Slack says, Objection. The investigators have overlooked a clear suspect who deserved consideration. The pandemic. For years, we were trained away from movie theaters, and even when they were permitted to go again, theaters became riskier propositions. They are big indoor spaces wherein transmission thrives, and as co-counsel observes, the pandemic killed off smaller businesses, which included a lot of second-run theaters and their role in the theater ecosystem. Why was this suspect not questioned? Edit. Objection withdrawn upon new depositions being received. I think this is referring to the Nebula bonus companion video. Opposing counsel can respond if they wish. I mean, I think the second-run theater query, which isn't the one I thought of, is actually a great point. So yeah, uh, the pandemic, it's been covered already in the Nebula bonus video. As for second-run theaters, I, I don't know. I've heard people bring up the pandemic killing second-run theaters before, but I have no idea how much second-run theaters were even a thing like, in 2020. Like, in my hometown, we had one second-run theater that was there in my childhood, and then it closed in the early 2000s, and then we just didn't have one. And, like, here in the city, do we have any second-run theaters? I don't know. I'm just, like, I'm not, I'm really not sure how much of a market that is and how many there were. Like, I've heard people say that they died out in the pandemic, but... I don't know. I don't have any evidence to go off of. I haven't observed anything. So yeah, again, my take with the pandemic is it accelerated stuff that was already happening. And so if it finished killing second-run theaters, which is, you know, a bummer because, you know, those were cool, uh, then, you know, that was already happening before the pandemic. And look, a lot of the box office has, you know, bounced back post-pandemic. So yeah, I've, I've explained this already, but I do not think it's as big a culprit as people say. Nick says, has prestige TV also helped kill cinema? In other words, have shows like Succession, Breaking Bad, and many others done a better job of catering to an adult audience? Why take the time to go to the movies when you can get amazing serial dramas with adult themes each week at home? This is particularly true if you care about things other than expensive special effects. They also have created a crop of TV stars like Aaron Paul or John Hamm. This this dovetails with the point you are making about Netflix Ted Sarandos not valuing the big screen cinema experience, but it's a different perspective. Maybe the prestige TV product is a good cinema replacement for many people, particularly, particularly those who aren't teenage boys. So this is another thing that I covered at length in the Nebula Bonus Companion video. I mean, honestly, at this point, if you are still watching this video, I really hope you have signed up for Nebula and watched that video because it covers so many of the answers to these things. But the short version is that, no, I do not think Prestige TV actually killed cinema. Uh, in the book that I cited in, in the video, uh, uh, Sleepless in Hollywood by Linda Obst, uh, someone who produced movies for years and then moved over to producing TV, the reason she transitioned to TV was, was not because TV had like replaced movies, but it was because she found that in the 2000s, uh, the original movies that she used to make uh, were just like, she couldn't get them uh, greenlit anymore. And so that seemed to be what happened first. Studios trending in this direction. And while that was happening, TV started building up and building up. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I don't think TV came along and like just killed things because look, I mean, a lot of these things like, you know, the, the Sopranos started in the late 90s. And also, like, I just fundamentally think that TV and movies are different mediums that function, like, best alongside each other, and one isn't a, really a replacement for another. Like, you know, committing to watching a seven-season TV show, that's like a big commitment. It's a lot different than sitting down to watch one two-hour movie that's just, you know, it's done after you watch it. And also, you know, you look at interviews with, like, a million screenwriters, and they were just like, oh, I went to TV because I couldn't get movies made anymore. Um, yeah, it's not like TV just showed up and put movies out of business. So, but look, it's complicated. There is no simple answer. Watch the Nebula bonus video. Navaronagon says, Patrick, regarding the Who Killed Cinema video, wouldn't streaming be far less of a problem if services used an Amazon-like pay per rental model? So basically, doesn't this mean Netflix did it? Because they were using a subscription model to put everyone, streaming services not named Netflix along with theaters, out of business. I mean, I kind of think these are 
two essentially different things because the pay per rental model, like that was around years before streaming with just like on demand, you know, like movies on demand where you can spend a few bucks and rent a movie there on your TV. And it's still very much around today with like iTunes and Amazon and stuff like that. It's funny, I I know that like it's, it's you know, more cost effective to subscribe to like Netflix than to like rent everything. But so often I, I, I see people act like movies are impossible to watch, like if they're not on Netflix, forgetting that for like four bucks, you know, basically the price of like renting a movie at a video store, you can just go on Amazon or iTunes and, and, and rent basically any movie you want. So that's still there, but I think it's it's genuinely different than what streaming services are, which are basically a a library that you browse uh, with like lots and lots of stuff. And that's the thing, like I honestly watch more movies just through digital rentals than I do th like through streaming services like Netflix or Max or whatever, but the difference there is that I go in and I watch those movies. No, I like I already know what I want to watch, so I'll go in, I'll search for the movie, then I'll watch it, and that's just a different experience than browsing. Uh, you know, we used to browse the shelves of the video store. Now we browse through like the homepage on Netflix and and things like that. And the thing that we do have to acknowledge is that you know, Netflix is just a better value for a lot of people. You pay one monthly fee and and you can watch, you know, 10 movies a day if you want. I mean, like that's, you know, you couldn't really watch 10 movies a day because then you wouldn't sleep and you'd die. But basically you can get like all the movies you want rather than paying for each individual one. But actually, like I said in the ad read on the video, I think Mubi is kind of the best example of what streaming services should be. Because they're not spending billions of dollars on, on like, insane numbers of movies and TV shows that, that, you know, people could never possibly keep up with. And instead, they're mostly a really well-curated library of movies that you browse through. And, and yeah, that's what I think streaming services should be. Matt Storm, aka Stormageddon, the great Matt Storm. Considering the newest video, is there anything you would recommend to other movie nerds who might finally be starting to experience franchise fatigue, like myself, and want to break out from it and watch something else? Is there a movie or TV show that you feel flew under the radar that you wish more people saw in the last few years? Okay, so regarding franchise fatigue, I mean, the simplest solution is just to watch more movies that, you know, aren't part of franchises. Of course, as we discussed in the video, uh, over the past 20 years, Hollywood has has trained the public to, you know, almost exclusively just watch big, expensive franchise movies. And look, there's some really good movies that are part of franchises, but if that's all you're watching, then that's not a very balanced diet. And I kind of, I don't know, I, I feel bad for you because you're, you're missing so much great stuff. I mean, look, I would say uh, go back and watch my Best of 2022 video and Best of 2021 video, uh, where I in each video I have, like, my top 20 or 25 movies of the year. Um, those are all movies that I think are great, and so I would go watch those if you haven't. Find film critics that you like and whose tastes align with yours, and go look at their Best of the Year lists and read their reviews and see what they're into. You know, follow directors that you like uh, instead of just franchises that you like. There are are so many great movies released every single year. So just just go watch them. So yeah, but also on a very self-serving level, um go go watch my best of of the year uh videos uh so I can get those sweet sweet views. And also the movies that are covered in them uh are great. I watch those. Scapman John says, "I was surprised to see how quickly you let Roger Rabbit off the hook." When you think about it, Roger is responsible for popularizing three major issues with the film industry today. Number one, the use of relying on crossovers, multiverses, and IP references can all be traced back to Roger Rabbit. He's the reason we live in a Ready Player One, No Way Home, a new legacy culture. Number two, the idea of big-budget, relatively accessible franchise versions of original movies replacing rather than supplementing those original movies. Why watch Scorsese when you can watch Joker? Why watch Seven when you can watch The Batman? Why watch Chinatown when you can watch Roger Rabbit? Number three, the idea that patty cake scenes are unnecessary if they don't progress the plot. Are you sure Roger Rabbit isn't secretly the Kaiser Soze of your lineup? 
and now I slow motion shot of me dropping this glass and it shatters on the floor. Um, yeah, you know, this came up earlier, the whole Roger Rabbit thing. I think this is an even better argument. Um, yeah, Roger Rabbit, he might, he might really be the guy. Ah, that, that wascally wabbit getting away once again. Oh my God. I was too easy on him. Okay, Quantum Quinn says, Hi Patrick, enjoyed the video and really agree with the overall takes about the missing mid-budget movies. I wanted to ask about the related issue of quality of the movies that are being made. Even as someone who used to consider myself a fan of superhero movies and was decently served at the theater for quite a while, it seems to me that a lot of superhero fatigue can be attributed to the average superhero movie getting worse. With exceptions, of course, but you know. Similarly, a lot of the devaluing of the Pixar brand seems to be to be due to their movies being much less consistently good, with exceptions, of course, but you know. So I'm curious, A, if you agree on the quality decline, and B, is this inherently related to all the factors you mentioned in the video, or has it just been unlucky to have a string of worse movies? I think it's related, but I'm trying to keep an open mind. Okay, so first off, in regards to Pixar, uh, yes, I think... The majority of people would agree that uh, the average quality of their movies lately, like over the past, let's say where it was, you know, for like the 15 years from like Toy Story through Toy Story 3 or whatever. That said, uh, Pixar has still released movies that I think are quite good and really interesting and uh, and still, you know, should be bigger than, than they have been. But with regards to superhero movies, um, I would not actually say the the average quality has gone down. Like, as someone, you know, who was, like, in high school in the 2000s, I mean, yeah, like, you'd get, like, a Spider-Man or a Spider-Man 2, but then you'd have, uh, you know, a Fantastic Four and a Daredevil and an X-Men 3 and, uh, you know, uh, like, like whatever your take on Superman Returns is, stuff like that. And even, like, Phase 1 of the MCU, well, Iron Man and Captain America 1 are really good, but, like, Iron Man 2 is a big old mess. Thor is, like, fine, it's okay. Uh, Incredible Hulk is not great. So it's not like they were dropping masterpieces all the time. And, you know, skip back a few years, and, like, even the same year as Endgame, uh, like, Captain Marvel and uh, Spider-Man Far From Home... I think are two of the weaker MCU movies. Um, I think the big issue now is is really just like the sheer quantity of them, especially with the TV shows as well. And you know they just don't feel special anymore. Uh, like the novelty is kind of gone. Um, and you know even though the average quality like level hasn't changed that much. So that's it. I think you know I guess people kind of burnt out over time. I mean I think what they need to try to do is just make a great movie. Just, just focus on that. Make one really terrific movie that everyone is going to get excited about um, and do something different. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's it. I don't, I don't think they've really gotten that much worse. Um, Jacob from Holland says, Hi, Patrick. Thank you so much and your entire team for making these videos. I love them. They are so good. Jacob, thank you. The main reason why I love them so much is that I learned from them. I started to think about the topic more than I already did. Also, I love it when a new video is being released on your channel. It's for me personally a big event. I call it the Patrick H. Willems Day. I make special time for it so I can pay all my attention to it, and I watch them on my 55-inch OLED TV. Jacob, I love this. I don't have a question, but more of a comment on the video, and would love it if you could reply to it. You had six lessons that could help prevent cinema from dying. One of them was learned lessons from Barbie and Oppenheimer. I totally agree with what you said at this moment. I agree with all of the lessons you mentioned, but you said during this specific moment that studios should be more open to more ideas. But don't you think that this idea is already happening? For example, the films that got nominated in 2022 for Best Film are, in my opinion, original stories. Examples are Women Talking, The Banshees of Anna Sharon, Tar, and The Fablemans. I know that all of these films are produced, written, and directed by people who have made other bigger films before. This year, a lot of original films are being released as well. Examples are Asteroid City, Bo is Afraid, and Killers of the Flower Moon, and also the ones you mentioned. Once again, all of them are produced and made by big-time directors. In my opinion, original films are still being made. Am I wrong, or do I see it in some way a bit wrong? Apologies for the long comment, but thanks so much for reading it. All the best, Jacob from Holland. So Jacob, yes, original movies are still getting made. And I think I do say that in the video, that there's still great original movies 
uh, being released every single year. You know, you look at the Oscars, you know, there's there's a bunch of, bunch of good movies nominated for stuff. But the issue is, is that these movies are viewed as like niche art house releases by the general public. But the movies that you mentioned here that were nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars this past year, Women Talking, Banshees of Sharon, Tar, and The Fablemans, none of them, not even the one directed by Steven Spielberg, even made $50 million. Uh, these movies are not hits. The general public is not watching them. Like, Asteroid City, uh, you know, that, that did well for like a smaller release, but I think that only made like $50 million. Bo is Afraid, that didn't make any money at all. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon is making some money, but uh, but that also cost $200 million. The point I was making in the video is that movies like these used to be mainstream movies that the general public would watch, and we'd get a lot more of them. And now these movies are basically only relegated to, to like, you know, smaller art house releases, you know, made for awards consideration. The general public is not watching them. And that's what I think the issue is. You know, you go back and you look at a Rain Man, uh, that was like the biggest movie of the year and it won the Oscar. But movies like these, even when they have movie stars like Colin Farrell and Kate Blanchett and stuff like that, uh, still viewed as like, you know, small niche movies uh, for a much smaller audience. So that is the difference, and I hope that makes sense. Okay, Rob Secundus has an extremely long comment that I just cannot fully read here. Uh, so I, 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 will, I will skim it and, uh, and then paraphrase it. Okay, so Rob's question here uh, really deals with, as he puts it, the death of art industries generally. Um, he's coming to this from the perspective of the, as he puts it, the ultra-niche field of online comics criticism, with, of course, you know, sites like CBR really going downhill to the point where they're literally having AI write articles, and, you know, and the late great site Comics Alliance, which I, I used to read constantly for years, uh, and then, of course, got shut down. And, and, then, and then talking about how in the comic book industry, as he puts it, uh, the big two retrained audiences to just not buy ongoing titles after constant cancellations and relaunches. If Gods is any indication, even titans like Hickman, who just a few years ago could sell an entire relaunch of a decomposing line, can't sell new things on their name alone anymore. And indie companies treat their books as IP farms to sell to Hollywood, resulting in this streamer-like state where the art they produce is just treated like... Uh, like content commodities, and the actual creators involved rarely get paid what they're due. And then looking at the publishing industry, and TV, and the video game industry, uh, with, he says, triple A titles have insanely expanded in budget and bloat. Man, Rob, this is a, this is a bleak comment. Although, you are not wrong. Uh, I don't know if I really have an answer or a solution here. Like, I watched as... The comics criticism industry uh, really kind of got worse and worse as many friends just had to leave it because it, it you couldn't make money there anymore. I do think with, with the comic book industry, I think a big problem there is really uh, just how bad they are at marketing. Like looking at, uh, at like Gods, the big new, you know, Jonathan Hickman thing from Marvel, and, and you'd see things online with uh, with people who run comic stores being like, you know, no one's interested in this. We're just not ordering it, and uh, this should be bigger. I really think that Marvel is just bad at marketing things, uh, and, and there's a way to, like, hype that up, um, you know, in the way of, like, you know, Nolan and Oppenheimer uh, that, that they could have done successfully. But also, but yeah, you know, when it comes here to, like, is everything in every industry just becoming content and dying out? I don't know. Things are bad. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm just going to move on now. Uh, Rob, thank you for your comment. Um, but uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not the man with the, the answers here. Uh, I, can, I can really, I only have, like, the emotional bandwidth to focus on, like, cinema, uh, I because that's all I, I know more about that than the others. I I have no solutions for anything else, but um, you know I hope things 
change? Look, this is why supporting the artists that you care about is important. Uh, this is why curation is important uh, to like help people find good stuff that's worth supporting with their money. Um, but that, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Maybe the next comment will be you less bleak. Amo Stills says, I think it's funny to imagine if the studios in the 1970s applied the same strategies in making their films as Hollywood studios apply today. People would have been lining up to see The Wizard of Oz 5 and King Kong 6 instead of films like The Exorcist and The Godfather. I remember seeing Star Wars Rogue One in 2016 and feeling depressed that the highest grossing movie of that year was simply getting by on recreating thrills from a movie from 1977. I definitely felt cinema had died a bit. Let's hope it gains more life soon. Anyway, I love the video and all the wonderful art you make. Thank you, Patrick. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Okay, that is bleak, but it's also funny and entertaining. And also, with the examples you brought up, The Wizard of Oz got a legacy sequel in the 80s that flopped, was a big commercial failure, uh, even though the movie is really interesting. And King Kong got a remake in the 70s. And so they would still you know, revive these brands uh, and that kind of thing. But it is interesting how the general public was just less into sequels for such a long time. They really genuinely wanted new things. How times have changed. Conradder says, One thing I realized when watching the Who Murdered Cinema video, that all those Marvel DC superhero movies have become essentially the same and pretty much interchangeable, therefore the new ones are pretty much forgettable. As I have said here, the issue is the quantity of them. Uh, where if they still feel pretty much like they did over the past decade, it's just you know, hard to get as excited anymore. Example, over the summer I was on paternity leave, staying up to do the night feeds and watching movies. Checked my letterbox diary for that time and was surprised I had watched Venom Let There Be Carnage. I literally cannot remember a thing about it. Wrecked my head and I think there was a fight in a church. I don't know. The week before, I also watched Crimson Tide, mentioned in this video. It was just some dudes talking on a submarine and waiting on an email, and I loved it, and three months later, it still pops into my head. Do you know what my point is, except I love Crimson Tide? Yes, Crimson Tide is so good. Everyone, watch it if you haven't seen it before. It's wild to think back to a time when, you know, like, so much of the critical consensus was that Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson movies were like they were killing cinema. And now you go back and you watch Crimson Tide and it's like, wait a second. Tony Scott directed this. It looks gorgeous. It's a big blockbuster movie that's really about Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman just like, you know, acting really, really hard and delivering dialogue from a script that was rewritten by Quentin Tarantino. And that was viewed as like, you know... A, a big, broad, mainstream blockbuster. Like, man, bring back those days. Okay, Crantastic says, Hi, Patrick, longtime fan. This latest video uh, got me to finally join the Patreon. Welcome. My question is as follows. I was curious as why there wasn't a mention of the rise of television as an artistic medium in the last 25 years as a factor. You know what I'm going to say. Check out the Nebula bonus companion video. I think it was David Fincher, but I could be mistaken, who brought up how all these auteur directors started going to HBO and these cable channels precisely because they were being given the creative freedom not permitted to them by the big film studios. The same goes for a lot of big-name movie star actors, too, like Glenn Close, who said she did The Shield and Damages precisely because it was the type of artistically interesting roles she wasn't getting from movie studios at the time. When you look at the era of cinema that's being discussed, 70s to mid-90s, television was still in its infancy with sitcoms and soap operas. But with the onset of prestige television, in my opinion, there's now a new worthy competitor to cinema in terms of audiences, time, and attention, and a bigger one than TikTok and cell phones. So I've basically covered all this stuff already uh, in earlier questions and comments. Um, but yeah, like with the thing uh, with Fincher and other directors like going to TV, you know, that was happening because the way the studios were changing their decisions about like what movies to make, people couldn't get the same movies made anymore. It wasn't that they were just like, TV is better than movies. It was like, there's nowhere else to go. I gotta go to TV. I've said this before. Um, I think these things were kind of on parallel tracks. Uh, television did not kill movies. Uh, movies started going this direction. 
uh, while like in the background television was evolving. Anyway, I'm, I'm repeating myself. Moving on. Jen says, great video. Thank you. So many questions about the death of cinema, but a lot are already addressed by my Discord compatriots. So I will ask, what guided your mustache choice, and how did you find the best one? Like, literally the best one in existence, maybe. Thanks. Ah, now here is a question that no one has asked yet. Uh, there's the mustache, of course, uh, right there. So, what happened with the mustache was when we were developing the video and figuring out, like, what angle to take with it, originally we were thinking we'd have different sections of the video take the form of kind of, like, different types of, like, murder investigations, like, have one uh, as kind of like a, like, Seven or Zodiac style, like, serial killer drama, uh, have one be like a, like a 1940s black and white noir, and then have one be kind of an Agatha Christie style, like drawing room mystery with all the suspects assembled, uh, as I kind of go through each one. And then we just, we kind of realized that it just worked better to just do the Agatha Christie one, uh, and, and stick with that through the entire thing. And then it wasn't me, it would have been Jake or Mike, uh, throughout that like, oh, Patrick, you should have, like, a Kenneth Branagh Poirot-style, like, big, ridiculous mustache and, like, do an accent. And I was like, yeah, that's fun. So we settled on that, that we, we would kind of do our little, like, Poirot thing. And then I went to uh, the great New York costume store, Abracadabra, on West 21st Street. It is so much better than a Spirit Halloween. They have, they have really good stuff. It's, like, two levels. They also have, like, super high-end costumes if you want to buy those, but, like... So much stuff, and they also have a whole section of, uh, of like, makeup and prosthetics and, like, good stuff. I, oh, one sec. Here's my, like, uh, my, like, ma makeup and, and stuff, uh, bag. So I have, I have bought many, many a wig or fake mustache or whatever there over the years for different videos. Like, here's a mustache. Uh, here's a mustache. But anyway, um, I was pretty confident that there they would have what I was looking for. So yeah, I went to Abracadabra, and I bought the biggest, curliest, grayest mustache they had. It was perfect. It was right there in the glass case. I think it cost 18 bucks. Uh, and yeah, it worked out really well. Thank you for the question. Okay, Andrew. Um, I was honestly surprised that the Roger Rabbit inclusion turned out to be just a joke, because I think there's a legitimate argument to be made that the film led pretty directly to the current problems with blockbuster cinema. Man, people have it in for Roger Rabbit. It's a film that I really love, but I've seen it be criticized, not illegitimately, for being a movie about spectacle and the incredible technical aspects more than it was really about the plot, although I like the plot. I know you made the Zemeckis video a few years back and talked about how it was a bit of a harbinger for his career, but I don't remember what your thoughts were as to how it affected Hollywood or if you really brought it up as I haven't seen the movie since its release. In any case, I'm curious how you feel about that movie as it relates to the evolution or de-evolution, as some may argue, of blockbuster cinema. On another note, was it intentional to do the Poirot bit as a hint that everyone was a killer, echoing a certain iconic Poirot story, or is that a happy accident? So as for the Poirot thing, um, uh, no, we uh, we really just wanted to do it because... Um, you know, we thought the the kind of Agatha Christie style format uh, of like kind of going through like the motives for all the suspects together was a fun way to do it. And um, I think we, we came up with that before I'd figured out the ending. And as for Roger Rabbit, if he really is, you know, the true culprit who is killing cinema, um, I think it's more likely because of the things that other people brought up with, uh, you know, the IP crossover stuff and that kind of thing. Because as for what you said about, you know, spectacle and incredible technical aspects, it was not the first movie uh, to be sold largely on, you know, the amazing visuals and, like, technical aspects. I mean, that was, like, the biggest draw of Jurassic Park a little bit later. Um, but I think these are also just great movies that are more than just you know, their impressive technical achievements. And so I'm going to say no. Like, that I don't think is enough evidence to convict Roger. But we do have a lot of evidence, so I don't know. That rabbit better watch out. Moving on. T. Kogan says, With the death of the movie star case, it would be interesting to know who you think of the current generation of performers has the potential to be the next big stars. 
so we already got a question like this. Uh, I talked about how I've been rooting for Glenn Powell to be a movie star for a while, and um, and I continue to draw a blank. I mean, there's there's a bunch of people who are like really well known and popular now, but I, I'm like, I don't know. Is like, are we calling Florence Pugh a movie star yet? Uh, because like, she really seems like she's pretty much there. It's it's the weird thing with her where where she joined the MCU but really doesn't need it. If anything, her being attached to Marvel stuff seems like it's going to be a hindrance because her career is going so well and people like her so much and she's made such good choices that, like, she's kind of done the the classic movie star thing of just being really good in good movies and uh, she kind of doesn't need the franchise. So, I don't know. I'm sure there's a bunch more. I'm bad at this. Moving on. Pinball Witch says, Hey Pat and everyone else who worked on the Who Killed Cinema video. Great work as always. Thank you. Uh, it was an interesting and fun way to discuss such a messy and complex topic. As is usual for me, my comment is a little long, so feel free to pause and paraphrase. Um, I also really enjoyed the Nebula exclusive companion piece, uh, and in particular how you discussed why capitalism wasn't one of the suspects in the video. I think you were spot on when saying how people will just throw out, well, it's all capitalism's fault, as basically a thought-terminating cliché, not to try to better discuss the way the system is part of all systemic issues that happen inside it. I think there could be a case for specifically the current form of late-stage capitalism that could be made from things like the rise of VFX-focused blockbusters when VFX workers are only now starting to fight for things like unions when most other sectors of filmmaking have had unions for decades, to how tax breaks and not releasing works to not have to pay royalties incentivize action like Zaslav's shelving of completed projects. But I imagine this would be a topic worthy of its own video and probably for someone more focused on the industry and economics. And obviously, there's no one single answer, but I really enjoyed your thoughts and wanted to share my own. Thanks for all the great work uh, from you and everyone else involved. Hashtag waiting for Jakestis. Uh, yes, I, I basically agree with what you're saying. And as far as that stuff about the late stage capitalism of it all, I think that's really for someone more focused on like the economics here, where that is not my area of expertise. And, uh, and there's really only so far I feel comfortable going with that because yeah, I'm just, I'm just not an expert on it. Uh, so I would love to see other videos people could make uh, about the economics of our current situation with American cinema. That's all. Hashtag waiting for Jakestus. Moving on. The questions on this video are long. Shadow Earth Shaker says, Hi, before I ask my question, two notes. Number one, you can have an accent even without a mustache. After all, Benoit Blanc doesn't have a mustache, but a very believable southern accent. Uh, that's not actually accurate. You really do have to have a mustache to have an accent. See, it's not in the movie, but Benoit Blanc used to have a big bushy mustache, and that's where he got the accent from. Uh, two, there is an editing error around 1 hour 12 minutes where the Roger Rabbit image is suddenly back on the wall and then disappears again. Uh, so just so everyone is aware, um, if, you, if you catch, uh, a, you know, an editing or continuity error or a typo in a video, um, you you don't have to tell me about it because I'm aware. I I yeah I'm I'm always aware, and uh, and and usually like a hundred people will all point it out to me, like the second the video is released. So it's impossible for me not to know about it. Um, so yeah, I'm I I realize it. The one you're talking about here um, is not actually an editing error. It's just a continuity error because we shot. Uh, parts of that scene out of order, and I I noticed that when I was editing the video, and um, it there was no way around it. I just had to do it and uh, and hate myself for missing it on set. So that's all. Anyway, now the question. Is the pandemic really an accomplice in cinema's death, or isn't it much more the Good Samaritan helping cinema up? Yes, the pandemic hurt movie theaters a lot and accelerated the rise of streaming, but I would argue that it hurt movie businesses' previous business much more in the long game. And number one, studios bet a lot on streaming because of the pandemic, and now it's too much for people. Number two, expensive films got much more expensive due to filming delays and such, and then they currently don't bring in the money, resulting in loss, while smaller films had a much smaller risk with that. 
Number three, the year 2020 was kind of a pause of all the big IP stuff, and people actually had a chance to watch other good stuff, which they hadn't found out otherwise because it was always hidden behind the massive IPs, and that made audiences realize, wait, I have an actual choice. And like most of the successful films of the past years, wasn't successful because of the IPs, but other things. Tenet and Oppenheimer are Nolan films. Barbie and Dune are IPs, but it's the director's vision which made them successful. Top Gun Maverick had movie star Tom Cruise, and people didn't watch Across the Spider-Verse for the IP or story, but because they were fans of the animation style. This is an interesting take, and I think it's honestly too early to say. This is kind of an accelerationist point of view, because uh, it's saying that studios going all in on streaming and spending tons of money there and spending tons of money on inflating budgets for movie productions during uh, the pandemic is currently like coming back to bite them and going to keep getting worse. And so it theoretically will force them to change going forward, uh, which in some cases might be true. I mean, you've already seen uh, studios like Warner Brothers like starting to pull back from streaming and, like, Apple deciding that they're actually gonna, like, focus more on theatrical releases. And so we've already got that. And so would that have happened without the pandemic? I don't know. I will say, in terms of the 2020 pause and people watching other things, um, I know, I mean, like, I kind of enjoyed that because without new releases to keep up on, uh, and also without anything else to do, I was just watching, like, three movies a day for a while and, like, filling in, like, all these gaps in my film viewing. But I know a lot of other people would just, like, re-watch things or watch the most, like, low-stress things imaginable. Uh, you know, like, Tiger King and Love is Blind, like, blew up uh, during that time. So I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know. But it's an interesting take. Oh my god, there's <laughs> every comment is so long. <gasps> Woo! Um, okay, Juliusk says, great video, very comprehensive, but I think there may be one more suspect, one I've never heard an American talk about, infrastructure. Where I live in the Netherlands, movie theaters are currently doing better than ever. We mostly get the same movies here as in the U.S., so why are Dutch people still going to the cinema so much more often than Americans? I think it might be because it is so much easier to get there and so much nicer to be there for most Dutch people than it is for most Americans. Okay, so I'll, so I'll paraphrase the rest of it, but basically what Juliusk is describing is that, um, you know, the suburbs and the need for cars in America and also, you know, just like where movie theaters are and the whole experience of, of going to it uh, is just, it's worse in America and it's... It's harder for people who are not adults with cars to go to the movies in the first place, while apparently in the Netherlands, it is much easier for even, like, 12-year-olds to get to the movies. Um, I honestly can't really say. I mean, okay, I, I will say growing up in my hometown, uh, yes, you needed a car uh, to get to the movie theater. You absolutely did. It's funny, actually, now, in my hometown, uh, the theater where I saw every movie for the first, like, 18 years of my life uh, was at a mall that you had to drive to. And now, in, like, the downtown area of my hometown, now there is a movie theater that opened... I think it opened there in, like, maybe around... Was it, like, 2013? Something like that? But anyway, and now people can walk to that, but, you know, that's, like, a recent development. But, uh, but yeah, I, look, I'm in New York City, and so I'm so spoiled because, you know, we have movie theaters everywhere here that you can easily take the subway to. But, uh, but yeah, I think what we're getting at is that America uh, is, you know, often poorly designed, especially compared to Europe. This is where we need, like, a crossover with, like, I don't know, like, not just bikes, where, where we can get into the effect that, I guess, urban planning and uh, and cities and suburbs and stuff like that, and infrastructure in general, the effect that has on movie theater attendance, because this is not something I really am qualified to talk about. But you make a compelling case. J, period, says, what are your thoughts on how streaming and social media have affected the advertising of movies? 
With streaming services, we don't get commercial trailers like we did on broadcast and cable TV, and with social media, we only get the trailers for movies that the algorithm gives us. Unless we actively seek out trailers or go to the movies, we are only exposed to the upcoming movies that are fed to us. I think that's a really good point. Because, yeah, uh, TV spots on broadcast TV um, have really, ever since like the mid-70s, uh, been one of the biggest aspects of film advertising. This is another one of those cases where I am very spoiled and I live in a little bubble here in New York City because uh, if you have never been to New York City, um, uh, it is impossible to not be aware of major new movie releases while living in the city because you are bombarded with ads for them in subway stations, on the side of buses, on top of taxis, with billboards everywhere. Like, to use my family as a case study again, uh, my sister Mary used to live here in the city, and then, uh, and then in 2019, she moved to Vermont. Uh, and now when I mention a movie tour that I went to see, she's always like, what's that? And I'm like, oh right, yeah, now that you don't live in the city, you're not just getting that that constant bombardment of movie advertising everywhere you go, and it's just very easy to not be aware of things if you don't seek it out on your own. Uh, so J period, yes, I think you're right. Sebas Castell says, Hey Pat, I'm curious if you actually do think Netflix will inevitably cave into putting more stuff theatrically as it becomes more clear that the streaming model isn't profitable. So this is something that I'm really curious about. I will say, uh, just a few days ago, I went to see The Killer, the new David Fincher movie, at the at Brooklyn Alamo Draft House. And uh, that movie is currently playing in, I think, like four or five theaters in the city. And it hasn't been released on Netflix yet. And that alone is progress. Like, it's not saying much. I don't think it's playing in many theaters around the country. But, uh, but it used to be, for Netflix releases here in the city, they would go to like one theater, like one weird theater, like the IPIC uh, at South Street Seaport. And so this is a little bit of an improvement, but it's still not even where like Glass Onion was a year ago, because that played in AMC theaters and this is not. Uh, and so look, I really hope so, uh, because again, Netflix, wouldn't you like to make money? Um, please release Hitman in theaters? Because yes, I can go to the Paris Theater, which is owned by Netflix, and see a Netflix release there, but, uh, but what about the people in the rest of the country? Like, the only option they have is waiting for it to go onto Netflix and watch it at home, and, um, and that's a bummer. But uh, I'm not optimistic, but, you know, fingers crossed. David M. Dot says, I think another often overlooked casualty of streaming is the discount slash second run theater. This really hit me several weeks ago when I was at my local 30 screen AMC on National Cinema Day when tickets were only $4 and all 30 theaters were full in a way I haven't seen in my adult life. Like home video, this was another kind of safety net that could catch movies that maybe didn't do great in their initial run and now they basically don't exist. Do you think there's any reality where discount theaters could make a comeback, or has the shrinking of the theatrical window rendered them fully non-viable? So second-run theaters came up in an earlier comment, and honestly, I just don't really know, because I haven't really thought about second-run theaters in years, and uh, I can't remember the last time I really encountered one. And so I just don't know enough about like that aspect of the theatrical industry uh, to really know. But I will say that uh, the shrinking window between the theatrical release and then like the the home video streaming VOD release, I think that really plays a big role because if it's only like, you know, a month or two, that's not enough time uh, for them to like leave like regular theaters and go to the second run theaters. So, uh, so yeah, that... It, it might just be fully dead. Alas. Mr. 12 Pips says, Hello, you beautiful person. Thank you. I have two questions. I just watched Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein the other day, and it got me thinking of your argument on movie stars. Would you consider things like The Muppet Christmas Carol, which maybe is something you're planning for the long-awaited Muppets video, I don't know, or Tom and Jerry Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Hold up. Tom and Jerry... Colon, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, that's, that's a thing? 
I have never heard of this before. But anyway, moving on. Would you consider them something in the same vein? Because then things start getting kind of messy. Like, people would be watching these movies specifically for those characters in lieu of actual movie stars or something. Where would that line even be drawn? I don't know. I actually lost the thought when I was trying to wrap my head around how Tom and Jerry slash Willy Wonka is a thing that exists, but I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts if you manage to untangle my thought vomit. I mean, there have always been like, non-human characters uh, in, like, multiple movies before. Like, way before there were the Muppets, you had, like, Lassie and Benji, you know, like, dogs that were movie stars, uh, that sort of thing. So, no, I think those exist alongside regular movie stars. The, the thing that the video is actually talking about was, like, when, when people who should be movie stars they are the ones playing the characters, and so the characters become famous, not them. But it's like, you know, Kermit is a real guy. He's Kermit. Right. He's the star. Yeah. No one plays Kermit. It's just Kermit. Oh, and if that's too much of a question, my second is this. What is your weekly movie watching schedule like, both for pleasure and for video research? Like, what's the whole process? Okay, so my schedule really changes week to week depending on how work is going. Like, if it is a crazy editing week, uh, I might just not watch any movie all week. I will say right now, I am working on researching and writing the uh, the video about Dwayne Johnson and Ryan Reynolds, which is the next episode. And that I'm watching at least a movie a day for research, but then also trying to, to pop in the occasional just watch like for my own enjoyment. Uh, but then also try to find time to, to catch up on movies and theaters that I want to watch. Like, I just saw, like, The Killer and The Holdovers. And so, in an ideal week, I would love... I love it when I can watch a movie a day, uh, whether for research, pleasure, or in theaters. But it doesn't always work out that way because my work schedule gets crazy. So, yeah, it really kind of varies week to week. Okay, uh, Max Brannon says, Hello, Patrick and Team Willems. I was excited for your Who Killed Cinema video from the moment you unveiled the mustache, and it did not disappoint. Nice. I work for a badass movie theater that will remain unnamed. I get to have brief conversations with people coming in uh, and who are often eager to share why they went to see a movie. This is largely anecdotal, but one thing I hear a lot is that a director is a big draw. Could it be that star directors are somewhat replacing the star actor? Thanks for all that you do, Max. So this is similar to one of the really early comments that we covered here today in this video uh, in terms of like the, the star director and the directors becoming more of a draw than the actors. But Max, I think the really key part in your question here is that you say you work for a badass movie theater. And I think that if you work for someplace like, you know, like an Alamo Draft House or a Nighthawk or a Metrograph or like a Film Forum or IFC Theater or Angelica, any kind of like either like art house or specialty or niche theater, there you are catering to an audience that is different from the average movie going audience. And you're catering to an audience that is just generally more passionate about and more knowledgeable about movies, you know, more of a cinephile crowd. Um, and so, yeah, for them, the director absolutely will be like the biggest draw. But if you go to an AMC theater, I think the majority of the audiences are not going to be paying a lot of attention to the directors. So I don't think things have really changed very much. I just think, I think you, you're just working at a cool theater that has a cool clientele. Lippin Lippin. Lippin Lippin? I don't know. Hi, Patrick and team. Thanks for all your work. I've been enjoying your videos for several years now. My question to this video is, don't we see the resurgence of movie stars right now? I have several friends in the age of 20 to 25, and they are fans of Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya specifically. They watched Dune and are waiting for the sequel only because of these two actors. I would also add Margot Robbie to the list as a person who basically co-creates movies she's in or really chooses them. Would you consider this trio movie stars of modern cinema? Thank you. Um, I would consider these people all kind of rising stars who could become major movie stars. Uh, in that that list that I, I talked about in the video of, like, the actors that people were surveyed about for, like, you know, who would they go to a movie theater to see, uh, none of those three cracked the top 20. I think 
Chalamet was lower down, closer to like 50. Because these people, especially like like, like uh, Timote and Zendaya, they're very big with like younger viewers. But also consider this. Um, has has Zendaya even like headlined a movie herself? Like she's a supporting character in the Spider-Man movies. She's supporting in Dune. She's the lead on Euphoria, but that's a TV show. And with Chalamet, like he's mostly done art house stuff. Uh, and then like Dune has so many people in it that it's hard to like pin its success just on him. Like I think I think Wonka is gonna be a big test for him. So, but I think these are all people who, if they keep doing what they're doing and they keep having like good taste uh, and and doing cool projects, I think they could become major bankable movie stars. But I I wouldn't say they're there yet. Samuel says, Hey Patrick, it's obvious that in narrative segments of the most recent season, you've shifted from the bonkers sci-fi comedy shenanigans of the Charles saga to a workplace sitcom style with you, Dave, and Emma. I was wondering what was the reasoning behind this change. Are there any shows or movies you list as influences? If I'm honest, I do miss the more serialized storytelling of the previous season, but I also understand why you've scaled back a little. Thanks again, Pat and the entire team, for everything you do. Ooh, this is a question that I love. Uh, okay, so yes, we did obviously, you know, change the style and format this season. So obviously the whole Charles saga was such a weird experiment, and it, it escalated as it went on. We realized, like, oh man, you know, uh, enough people are into this that, like, we can, like, go further and further. But then once that was wrapped up, you know, I'd look at those videos and be like, huh, so, so a video about, like, baseball that opens with five minutes of characters who were not me discussing a coconut, maybe isn't the best way to, like, reach a wider audience. So we made the deliberate choice to make sure the narrative elements were tied a little more directly to whatever the topic was. Uh, and so, so you know, when you've got, like, the Taylor Swift video, like, the cold open, it's us, like, talking about winning tickets for a Taylor Swift concert, like, that kind of thing. Um, so it's a little bit more cohesive that way. But then also, the biggest thing is that um, I just had such a good time doing the talk show format in 2020. Um, I liked having the desk there. I really liked having a show within the show where the narrative elements kind of, like, you know, interrupt, like, the, the filming of the show. I like having a person off camera to talk to. And so we really just kind of wanted to bring it more back to that. Um, and then in terms of influences, uh, you know, we looked at, like, 30 Rock is obviously a big one. Um, we looked a bit at, like, the Larry Sanders show, that sort of thing. Like, the idea of having a show within the show and, like, the different people with the different roles there and obviously moving the videos over to shoot at the Nebula offices uh, really helped with that. And so, yeah, uh, you know, as usual, it's just us wanting to to try different things and experiment, and, uh, and we've had a lot of fun with this format. Okay, our final question comes from DARPA. Hi, Patrick. Great video. Loved it. Question about the Scorsese article you cited. I recall when the article dropped, a lot of the criticism I was seeing was how much it leaned into auteur theory, and it seems like some of your suggestions were also trending in an auteur theory direction. I'm wondering if there's an alternative to the binary of corporate sludge versus strong singular vision. Is there a tour that doesn't require us to put individuals on a pedestal and disregard the collaborating uh, contributions of others. Okay, so the great question of auteur theory. So I, I'm i gonna, this might be a controversial statement, although I did say this uh, earlier this year in the video, in the like film 101, how to talk about movies video. I think auteur theory kind of gets a bit of a bad rap. And I think that mostly comes from when people use it to just, you know, like give the director all the credit uh, and, and, and mostly to kind of lionize, um, you know, this like group of, of old white men and excuse any like bad behavior they did because it's all in service of like their genius vision. But I think the fact is that a lot of the time with movies, especially if we're talking about movies from people like Martin Scorsese or, you know, like in that Scorsese piece, uh, like Fellini, is that a lot of the time movies are 
you know, made and, and run by one primary singular vision, and that is the vision of the director. You know, you look at Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, Scorsese developed the project. He co-wrote the script. He directed it. He was in charge of, like, you know, choosing uh, the heads of the various departments and his collaborators and overseeing casting and all that kind of thing. And so, yes, there are a ton of really talented artists working on it in front of and behind the camera. There's a ton of collaborations going on. But also, everyone is primarily working you know, to try to execute this one main vision that, that they're all working with. And I think there is a way to talk about movies where, you know, you do recognize that this is, you know, kind of first and foremost, like, you know, a Scorsese movie, uh, but also you can, you can talk about his filmography in terms of, like, his collaborations with different people, like how his movies that are shot by Robert Richardson are different from his movies shot by Rodrigo Prieto. Because, like, I don't think auteur theory is fundamentally a bad thing. It really is is just a lens through which to look at movies. And you can apply auteur theory to, like, sometimes writers or actors or producers and stuff like that. And I personally don't think that we should devalue uh, the work of directors and, like, try to say, like, oh, you know, they didn't really do much themselves. They didn't really operate the camera. Like, a lot of people worked on the movie. Uh, like, yeah, it is true. Um, you know, film is a collaborative medium, and it's also a medium where, you know, the director is often king, and, uh, and, and most of the major decisions come from that person. And so I think I think these two things can exist side by side, uh, and and I think um, yeah I don't know I I think that Scorsese piece about Fellini is is pretty good and uh, and and if Marty says that he loves Fellini's movies because of Fellini's vision uh, I I would not tell him he's wrong so that's just me and okay. That is it for the Discord questions. Uh, there were a lot of them, and some of them were really long. But look, I'm, I'm not complaining. This was a very long video that covered so much, so obviously there was a lot to talk about, so thank you all for sending in the questions. But we're not done yet. Now it's a part that uh, we didn't have maybe in the last couple Patrick Replies episodes, uh, but this is the the snail mail part, the, the part where... I, I open whatever uh, was in the P.O. box. Um, if you want to send stuff to the P.O. box, uh, you know, the, the address is in the description. It's in the description of all the videos. It's in the About section of the channel. Uh, if you don't want me to open it on camera, then just, like, write a note or whatever. But anyway, uh, okay, what do we got first? We got a letter. I will not show the return address. Okay. We have what looks to be a handwritten letter. It's about the latest video, Who Is Killing Cinema? I'm not going to read the entire thing out loud here. Uh, a letter from Colin uh, starts out, Dear Patrick, longtime fan, I was thinking of leaving a very, very long comment on your Who Is Killing Cinema video when I remembered that you mentioned your P.O. Box in our replies video, and wouldn't you know it, I really enjoy writing letters. Dropping this letter off at the mailbox across the street from my apartment will scratch the itch of mailing my Netflix DVDs back, a recently deceased small joy. Yeah, I, I still have, uh, because they didn't make you return them, um, uh, the two DVDs that I that I had out from Netflix uh, when the the service shut down on my birthday this year. Actually, yeah, Netflix's final day of their DVD by mail program, the the program that the company was built on, uh, shut down on September 29th, 2023. A day that I will remember for the rest of my life. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm just skimming through Colin's letter here, which is, is really nice and He's really smart, uh, but only I get to read it. This part, I think, is worth bringing up. This is just a good, smart comment. As mentioned, I was a Netflix DVD subscriber up to the bitter end. I only got the service during COVID, not only because it had a library that easily dwarfed every streamer, it's true, but it felt like receiving a present in the mail every single time. Netflix's decision to shut the service down when, as of a few years ago, was actually still turning a profit feels like their idiotic stance on movie theaters. They would rather tear down every established form of distribution and media consumption than actually make money and give the media they make the proper attention and care. Uh, I also heard that Redbox even made an offer to buy the DVD service, 
and Netflix chose to shut everything down instead, clearly hoping for the death of physical media as much as theatrical distribution. Let's see, th this part, he, okay, he's actually got a, a story here that is under an NDA, and so I will not read it out loud. Okay, this was an awesome letter. Uh, Colin, thank you so much for sending this in. This, uh, re really, really good stuff. Um, and a uh, great story in there that I'm sorry the audience, on only I will get to enjoy. But I also appreciate at the very end here, A plus Belfast joke from Emma. Thank you, we, we, we're proud of that Belfast joke. Also, uh, literally no one who worked on this, on this episode has actually seen the movie Belfast. Just never got around to it. Okay, uh, and next up, we have one that says, do not bend on here. Um, and I hope it's okay. When the woman at the post office was like squeezing it under the little, you know, the little like gap in the, the glass there, and I saw it curving a little bit, I was like, what are, you, what are you doing? It says do not bend, but I think it's okay. What do we got here? Okay, it's wrapped in paper. The Polar Express Collectible Lithograph. <laughs> uh, this is extremely funny. Is there anything else? <laughs> is that? Uh, this is from uh, Stephen Maneri. Uh, Stephen, thank you. Uh, <laughs> this... This is amazing, uh, and and incredibly funny. Oh, the Polar Express. Okay, well, uh, that ended this video on on a high note. Uh, that was delightful. So thank you to everyone who you know who mailed in stuff, who who sent in really thoughtful questions and comments. Except for the people who sent in not thoughtful comments, uh, I'm not thanking you. Um, but yeah, uh, that was great. Um, we worked really hard on this video. The response to it has been really, really great. Um, it seems like it actually brought a lot of new viewers into the channel, which doesn't happen very often. Um, so that's that's great to see. Uh, anyway, now I gotta edit this very, very long replies video um, and uh, and then get back to work, you know, talking about the careers of uh, Messrs. Johnson and Reynolds, which is interesting so far. Anyway, yeah, I, I gotta, gotta go finish watching Skyscraper. A Ross and Marshall Thurber movie. Anyway, uh, that is all for now. Thank you for watching. Good night.